Hello everyone, this uh, we are talking about GST and customs law, your indirect tax paper and CA's professional program. The advanced tax laws in the paper in the professional program is basically divided into two parts that is direct tax and indirect taxes. Where indirect tax covers the major portion of the syllabus and uh, DT that is direct tax forms 30 marks of the total paper that you are going to write for the professional program. Basically what is indirect tax? What is the subject of indirect tax all about? The basic difference between DT and IDT as you all have studied under the executive level, direct tax is that tax that is levied on an SSC where the levy and burden is borne by the same person. The levy of tax is on the SSC and the burden of payment of such tax also lies on the SSC himself. But whereas under indirect taxation, as you all have seen in your day to day life, you may have visited various places including restaurants, hotels, malls and various other places and may have purchased and uh, and received bills for all those items that you have acquired or purchased, you may have seen that every one of you, each one of us bear this tax called as the indirect tax. This is the major revenue to the government. Post 1st of July 2017, Government of India passed the four laws based on the constitutional amendments passed by the parliament and the laws formulated by the Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha and various other states across the country. Four laws were formulated in the form of CGST, SGST, UTGST and IGST and one more special law was brought into enactment called as the Compensation to States Act 2017 which basically was formulated in order to compensate the states for loss of revenue incurred by such states on introduction of GST. What is GST all about? Goods and services tax. So levy of tax is on goods and services. So there must be a point of taxation as was discussed under various laws that were in India prior to the introduction of GST. Most of you may have heard there were n number of taxes levied for any goods to come into the market and services that were provided by the service providers. There were acts like excise, there was service tax, there was VAT, there was CST and various other laws. In each one of them there was a point of taxation. Whenever there was a manufacture of goods in India, there was a act called as excise duty which was there was a duty called the excise duty which was levied on the manufacture of goods. When there was sale of goods within the state, there was value added tax called VAT levied by each of such state. When there was an interstate sale of goods, there was something called as a central sales tax and whenever there was a service provided, there was service tax levied on service provider. All these and many more acts were subsumed under one umbrella and this was enacted in the form of GST, goods and services tax and they formulated this into one enactment throughout India to have one uniform tax structure in the indirect tax regime. But you may ask there is also another act called as the customs act whether it is subsumed under GST. No, customs basically deals with import and export of goods in, in into India and outside India. Therefore, that cannot be subsumed under the umbrella of GST and it is still kept outside the purview and is a separate enactment altogether. What is this subject as we understood? Indirect tax under that goods and services tax. What is the role of a company secretary in studying indirect tax? All of you may ask, this is the role of a chartered accountant or any other person to deal with taxation. Why is company secretary student studying taxation? As a professional, as a compliance and legal officer of a company, you are mandated not only to know 
the theoretical aspect of various laws that you have studied in, in your executive level and you are going to study under the professional program including the major of company law. Under company law also there are lot of aspects that as a secretarial auditor you need to know. But much more than that as a professional you can advise your client as well as the company you are working for on the provisions of GST and how a company has to comply with the provisions of GST. In case of a manufacturing sector also where goods are imported and exported you will have to tell your company or client whether the provisions that they are following are in compliance with the law. So that is the reason as a compliance and legal officer of a company not only that as a consultant you can advise your company or your client on various matters or provisions under GST. You can be as an advisory, you can be as a consultant and not only that you can also represent through legal officers in front of various authorities like the uh, appellate tribunals and courts in India on the matters of indirect taxation. So let us understand what are you going to study under the provisions of GST and customs law. As I stated GST for you for professional program is for 70 marks and uh, overall indirect taxation is for 70 marks where 60 marks is concentrated only on GST and 10 marks is under the customs law. What is under GST? GST basically has been divided into 11 chapters for you with the introduction of what is goods and services tax and the reason for introduction of GST, the historical background behind it and the need of constitutional amendments that were made by the Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha and various other states to formulate and enact this law called the GST. Then you are going to study a unique federal structure that was introduced by the constitutional amendment called article 279A which formed the GST council by virtue of which the council has the power to uh, discuss on various aspects of GST including taxes and various other aspects including ITC uh, on what goods should GST be levied on what services GST must be levied all these are discussed under the council. This is a federal structure as I said the members of this council include the representation from the states and the union together and all the decisions are not taken unilaterally but together in the council with the discussions that happens in the council. You may have studied, you have seen the read the newspapers where every other month there is a decision taken by the council which is approved by the union ministers, the minister of uh, ministers and then it uh, and the cabinet approves it to become enactment in India through a notification. So that is what we are going to study under the provisions under the constitutional amendments under article 246A which is one of the most important article which enacted and gave powers in the constitution to the parliament and to formulate laws on GST then 269A and then 279A all these provisions are extremely important from the point of view of constitution and under this the four laws and the five the fifth law that is a CGS SGST Act was, that was enacted and passed by all the legislative assemblies in the state including the erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir which is now a union territory. Except for the two union territories in India which have their own uh, legislative assembly that is Delhi and Puducherry, every other union territory Andaman, Nicobar, Daman, Diu all those are considered as union territories under the provisions of UTGST except for the two union territories of Delhi and Puducherry. This is the provisions that are going to discuss under the first chapter that is with regard to the overview of goods and service tax. And then the most important discussion that under GST that is, uh, is a discussion also for the students as well as practice is what is the taxable event under provisions of GST. As I said prior to the introduction of GST there were various laws in India which levy taxes at multiple times in the supply chain whether it could be excise, whether it could be service tax, whether it could be VAT or CST but all these were subsumed 
and one taxable event was defined and is defined under the provisions of GST under the CGST Act under Section 7 that is supply. If you understand the concept of supply under Section 7, then the entire GST is half understood. If you know when any event can be considered as a supply, then it is easier for levy and collection of tax by the authorities. This is, the, this is where the role of a professional comes into picture. When you are advising your company and a client, you can tell whether an activity is a supply if you are a professional in this matter. As a legal officer, you can advise your company whether this uh, activity that is carried on by the company is a supply and whether that formulates a taxable event and whether levy of tax is right or wrong in such manner. Once you have understood the concepts of supply, just to brief on what is supply. Supply has been characterized into various forms under section 7. I will not go into the uh, provisions of section 7, but just to understand what formulates a supply. To understand in general, supply means supply of goods or services only. So that means the act must have defined what is goods and services they have. If supplies of goods or of services, then you can say there is a taxable event. Anything other than goods and services that is supplied, it cannot be classified as a taxable event. For example, sale or transfer of an immovable property. You have, you have an immovable property or a land and building in your name. You are transferring such property in somebody else's name for a consideration. Now the question is whether this event is a supply. You then you will have to go back to the definition of goods or services whether immovable property is a goods. The provision says no. Therefore, this is not a taxable event nor this is supply. The simple reason being immovable property and transfer of such immovable property is not covered under the provisions of goods and services tax. Basically, the reason behind this is you will have to go back to the constitutional provisions which talks about the union list, the state list and the concurrent list. Sale of immovable property is a matter of state subject and the union government cannot levy taxes on such things except, except where there is a first sale of any flat or apartment and there is a tripartite agreement between the seller and the buyer where the seller includes the person who is constructing, he has the power to collect GST only on the construction of such building, not on the land, only in the first sale. You, many of you in practice, you may have observed that only GST can be levied only on services in this case, not on goods. Basically, GST is not levied on sale of building here, but the services that was offered the first time when the construction or the, the constructor has constructed any building on the land. So that is one uniqueness and the, uh, the objective behind the provisions of supply is that supply can happen only on supply of goods and services and not otherwise. Then supply must be a taxable supply. Further under the provisions we will study that there are exemptions which have been given under the provisions of GST. That means those supply of goods or services which are exempted from the provisions of GST cannot be a taxable supply and therefore is not a supply. Supply must be in the territory of India or in the legal territory. IGST defines what is India. If we study, go back to the provisions of IGST Act, that is the Integrated Goods and Service Tax Act, it defines what is the territory of India, a taxable territory. Only if the supply is happening in the taxable territory, then you can say there is supply. So these are certain general characteristics of what formulates supply. To further go on, Section 7 defines in detail under Schedule 1, 2 and 3 and under the basic definition of supply, Supply means supply of goods and services for a consideration in the taxable territory. Okay, So this is the uh, definition of supply. Supply includes various aspects of uh, 
transactions which include sale, exchange, barter, etc. So, all these are considered a supply. The schedule 1, 2 and 3 under section 7 also tells you whether a certain activity is a supply or not. Schedule 3 basically talks about a negative list where they have clearly defined certain activities as not considered to be a supply at all. Section 7, after the provisions of supply, then you will have to understand certain provisions of what is a composite supply and what is a mixed supply. Basically, when there is supply of goods of one or more goods in a same basket and those goods or services are inseparable, meaning they are naturally bundled, then they are called as a composite supply. The provisions will define as to how the taxation of such supplies should happen. In case of mixed supply, when there are two or more goods supplied together, where each one of can, can be supplied separately also and not naturally bundled, how is the taxation on such supplies? Then you will study what is a composition tax or a composition levy under section 10 of the CGST Act. Composition levy is a unique uh, concept which has been introduced, which was, is not a new concept already there under the previous regimes of service tax and VAT as well, where small service, small service providers as well as small supplier of goods can enjoy the benefit of payment of tax and compliance at a reduced rate or a reduced level. A composition dealer needs to pay tax at a concessional rate. Okay. So, they do not have to comply with all the provisions of the law with respect to GST. And the compliances for filing and maintenance of records are comparatively lesser as compared to a normal GST payer. So, this is what a composition levy talks about. Then you will you will be studying various provisions of exemptions, what are the services and goods that are exempted uh, under the provisions of GST. Okay. And the most important aspects that you are going to study under the provisions of supply is the place and time of supply. So, what do you mean by place of supply? As I said, the characteristics of supply, supply must be in the taxable territory. That means you need to understand the place where the supply has happened. GST is basically a destination based taxation. That means if you are selling any goods from the state of Karnataka, to a person in the state of Maharashtra, then the destination there is important. Whether I can levy CGST, whether I can levy SGST, whether I can levy IGST depends on what kind of supply, whether it is an intrastate or an interstate supply. So, that is why destination based taxation comes into picture. If a person is supplying goods from Karnataka to a person in Karnataka only, it is said to be an intrastate supply. And if you, you all might have seen when you go to a supermarket to buy anything, you get a bill mentioning the value of your goods as well as two kinds of taxes, one is CGST, another one is SGST. The reason being, in case of intrastate supply of taxes, any person has to pay CGST and SGST. Why is this? Because GST clearly demarcates whom the revenue should go to. If, a if the bill contains CGST and SGST, you would always see that there is equal amount of tax in the bill. If 100 rupees is CGST, equivalent 100 rupees will be also SGST. That means revenue is shared between the central government and the state government equally. This is only in case of when there is an intra-state supply that is within the same state or within the union territory. If the supplier is located in Karnataka and the recipient of supply is located in Maharashtra or any other state in the country, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Andhra, wherever you take, then this kind of supply is called as interstate supply and integrated goods and service tax apply on such supplies, IGST in short. That means whenever there is interstate supply, the revenue goes to the union and it is divided later between the state and the central. Presently, as 
the decision taken by the council, the revenue shared in case of IGST is also equal between the central and the state governments. This is the provision with regard to place of supply. So, place of supply, why is it important to understand whether any supply is interstate or intrastate? Then you may ask, under the provisions of IGST, there are unique kinds of supply. Some examples I may give you. You are selling goods, say from Mumbai port to a person located in the high sea. Okay? Then whether should I classify this person located in the ocean as outside the country or within the country? IGST clearly defines what is the territory I said up to 12 nautical miles from the land, okay, it is considered to be part of the state itself. Beyond 12 nautical miles, up to 200 nautical miles, they are considered as part of India for the purpose of taxation and such high sea is considered as a union territory for the purpose of levy of tax. So, this is a unique provision which is introduced under the provisions of IGST where you are going to study how supply from land to sea or from sea to sea, what is the place of supply, how should you treat such supplies as, then time of supply, what time has the supply taken place, when should the invoice be issued, what is the due date of invoice. All these are studied under the provisions under section 12 and 13 as to how time of supply, that is time of supply is important in order to collect and pay tax to the government because burden as I said falls on the ultimate consumer in the supply chain under GST. When is the due date of payment of tax? Say for example, I have supplied certain goods today to a person, okay. I have not raised the invoice. I will raise it after certain days. The provision does not allow it. It says, as in when the goods are supplied, invoice also must be raised against it. The problem comes where advance is paid on certain supply of goods or services. You have not raised an invoice because the goods or services yet to be supplied to me or uh, or somebody else. In such cases, whether levy of tax can happen, the provisions under section 12 clearly demarcates that under provisions with regard to supply of goods, there is an exemption from payment of tax in case of advance received. But whereas in case of supply of services, even an advance is received, GST must be paid to the government immediately that is as on the due dates mentioned under the provisions of GST. For every month, their payment of tax falls due on the 20th of the subsequent month. That is through a return called as GSTR 3B. This is what is called as time of supply. So, you have understood what is time, what is supply, what is place. Now, you have to understand on what value should you levy such tax. That is understood under the provisions of value of supply under section 15 of the CGST Act. You not only have as to how to compute the value in the normal course of supply, but there are various rules of valuation okay, under which you have to ascertain the value of certain supply of goods and services specifically. This we can understand from the rules of valuation. This is what is covered under the provisions of supply under chapter 2. This is the most important chapter which covers almost 70 percent of your syllabus. If you understand this chapter 2, most of the chapters are understood automatically except for the procedural aspects under GST. The third most important and essential part of the GST, which is a unique feature that was brought into GST, is the concept of input tax credit. What is ITC? In short, it is called as ITC. In input tax credit is a concept where I am a supplier of goods or services and I have taken supply 
inward of certain goods to supply these to my customers from my vendors, I would have paid tax on these purchases and I am liable to pay tax on my sales as well. Whether the tax that I am liable to pay on my sales and the tax that I have already paid on my purchases can be set off. The government says yes. He says you are liable to pay 100 rupees of tax on your outward supply, but you have already paid 50 rupees on your inward supply, you pay only 50 rupees to me. This 50 that I have adjusted against my outward supply is called as input tax credit. The chapter is as simple as this, but only thing section 16, 17, 18 and 19 detail out as to how input tax credit can be utilized. There are rules and notifications which have been amended from the day this law has been inserted. From uh, 1st of July 2017, the concept of ITC has not remained the same till date. It has been amended, changed as in when GST is getting evolved. Today, if a person wants to claim input tax credit, just for example, section 16 lists out three important aspects based on which you have to claim input tax credit. The first provision says there must have been supply of goods and services. Second thing, the supplier must be in possession of a valid document to claim input tax credit. Third, the taxes must have been paid and the fourth, the returns should have been filed within the due dates. If all these four conditions are satisfied, then you are eligible to claim input tax credit. This is how the law fo was formulated. But with effect from 2021, the government came, with, came out with a notification which said, unless the supplier files his return within the due date and the same is reflecting in a form called as GSTR2B, you are not eligible to claim input tax credit at all. So the systems have evolved. They have made sure that only if a person files his return and makes the payment within the due date, then only input tax credit can be claimed. This is there, this benefit of ITC is there under every point under the supply chain that is from the manufacturer, then the wholesaler, the retailer till the ultimate consumer. Okay. Ultimate consumer cannot claim ITC. One concept that I did not mention under the definition of supply is supply I said must be of goods and services for a consideration. Then it says in the course or furtherance of a business activity. So ITC also is linked to this definition. Only if there is in the course or furtherance of business, then you are eligible to claim input tax credit. Otherwise, this benefit of ITC is not eligible for the supplier. This also discusses about certain aspects of block credits under section 17. Certain supplies of inward nature cannot be claimed for the benefit of input tax credit. For example, you have taken any club membership or uh, bought a motor car or any other those mentioned under the provisions of section 17.5 which talks about the concepts of block credit which basically says that if you have taken the inward supplies that is purchased these goods then you are not eligible to claim the tax paid on such goods as ITC. There are specific provisions. So in case of motor car as I said it is not a that every person cannot claim. If a person involved in the same business activity is eligible, otherwise he is not eligible. So there are various provisions which are covered under section 17.5 which talks about block credits under the provisions of GST. Then how do I know that I am eligible to be registered or how do I pay taxes to the government in the form of GST? Now we have understood what is supply time of supply, place of supply, value of supply and now ITC also. All the technical part of it we understood. But as a businessman, if somebody comes to you for a consultation to ask, am I eligible? How do you define? 
the provision says yes you are eligible only if your turnover crosses certain limit if your aggregate turnover in a financial year or in any year exceeds 20 lakhs in case of supply of goods services sorry and 40 lakhs in case of supply of goods then you are eligible for registration then the question would arise if i am supplying both what would be my limit of registration if my aggregate turnover exceeds 20 lakhs in case of supply of goods and services then i am eligible for registration and when should you take this registration within 30 days from the date you become liable for registration whether only this is the criteria for registration there are various other criterias mentioned under the provisions of registration okay not only aggregate turnover is one of the important criterias there are other criterias based on which you have to take your take the registration in case of a supply of goods or supply of services these are the procedural aspects that we are going to study under chapter 4 as to what is registration, how registration must be taken, what is the procedure for registration and just to, uh, for the information of the students, registration is absolutely free. As a professional consultant, if somebody approaches you, you may be charging for the consultation given but there are no government fees for the purpose of registration. Government or the department of GST will never come and ask you to pay a certain fees for registration. If you have the valid documentation, okay, and the kind of entity you are registering, you can get your registration within the date specified under the provisions of GST. Once you are registered, what happens? You will have to comply with all the provisions that are mentioned under the uh, under CGST Act or other enactments that are there. What provisions? That is, you have to keep records of all the outward supply. How are you claiming ITC? You must need to maintain all the records. You will have to claim ITC as per the provisions of section 16, 17 and 18. Okay. Then all these records become necessary. Who will check whether you have proper records? An audit. You may have studied under direct taxation under section 44AB that every SSC whose aggregate turnover or the turnover or professional receipts in case of turnover it is 2 crores and in case of professional receipts it is 50 lakhs under income tax act under section 44AB where audit is mandatory to be conducted by a chartered accountant. But in case of the provisions under GST audit becomes compulsory in case you aggregate turnover exceeds 2 crores and this audit can be conducted either by a chartered accountant or a cost accountant as defined under their enactments. Okay, Special audits are also mentioned under the provisions where the department can itself order for special audits where it feels audit is necessary or if it feels there is uh, need for audit in cases where they feel ITC is wrongly claimed or there is uh, you know the compliance of law is not being carried out properly by any SSE. So this is how audits can be conducted. Basically as uh, mentioned under uh, as you have studied under the DT the direct taxes and the executive level taxes paid on self-assessment you file your returns on your own nobody mandates you but the law similarly under GST also this is a self-assessment assessment is done by the SSE himself okay then there is department assessment there is best just a judgment assessment okay all those assessments uh, come in the future after the self-assessment of tax is done by the the supplier of goods or services scrutiny demand recovery all this is is going to be discussed under lesson 5 with regard to when scrutiny can happen of your books of accounts, how recovery and advance rulings can be claimed by the SSA. If he has any clarification, any aspects under the provisions of GST, he can ask for advance ruling so that he can uh, ease out the matters for his better compliance of the law. And if he feels he is aggravated by any order passed by the assessing officer, 
he can always appeal to the higher authorities he can go to the tribunal he can go to the courts in india including the high court and the supreme court where there involves interpretation of law chapter 6 you going to study with regard to when can officers of gst inspect your premises there is a department which is formulated under the provisions of gst called as the directorate general of gst dggi into investigation they can on show cause notice issue to any supplier of goods okay come into the organization come into your company or your business and inspect search and seize for offenses if they find are true in case on verification of the books of maintained by the supplier if they feel there are certain things which has been wrongly complied with then the officer or the commissioner or on the advice of the commissioner his uh, officers can seize any of the premises or the books or any aspect that is with regard to the provisions uh, under the law okay this is with regard to chapter 6 under your syllabus chapter 7 talks about who can be a gst practitioner who are the authorized representatives and what are the professional opportunities available in general and for company secretary in specific who can be a gst practitioner gst has allowed any person who applies and passes the examination conducted by the gst as a gst practitioner the company secretary also can enroll himself to be a gst practitioner and represent his or her client before the authority what kind of representations you can make it could be with regard to any advance ruling it could be with regard to any appeals and revisions it could be with regard to any matter uh, which is uh, which requires interpretation or it it could be factual in nature you can represent before the assessing officers you can represent before the commissioners you can represent before the itat this is discussed under the chapter 7 the next chapter basically which i've already covered section chapter 8 which talks about igst act as i told you after the enactments that were uh, made after the constitution of india gave powers for enactment of gst four laws were passed by lok sabha and rajya sabha that is cgst igst utgst and compensation to states and fifth law that is sgst act was formulated by all the states within their legislative assembly now igst as i told you when does igst come into picture when there is a taxable event in the form of supply which is interstate supply then igst comes into picture where where the supplier and the recipient are located in two different places the law defines separately for your easy understanding I'm just saying where the supplier and recipient are located in two different places, but the provisions under the GST says where the supplier is in a different state and the place of supply is happening in a different state, then the IGST can be levied. This is discussed and various provisions as as I told you, what is the territory of India? How can you levy tax in case of those specific scenarios that I mentioned to you? All this is going to be discussed under Chapter Eight. chapter 9 utgst act basically where union territory is involved that is in case of daman and diu andaman nicobar and various union territories other than the union territory of delhi and pondicherry which i said have a separate legislature of its own therefore they are considered states for the purpose of uh, levy under gst alone okay other than these two all of the union territories in india where utgst will be levied in place of sg sgst why because utgst is formulated and enacted by the lok sabha and rajya sabha because these are union laws union territories are directly governed by the union government therefore utgst is also governed by the utgst and the revenue collected in this union territory goes to the union 
for the benefit of the union territory itself. And the last chapter under GST, which basically talks about the GST compensation to states, which is a fading act now, but we don't know what is the status of this post July. Up to June 30th, 2022 at least, we have this act in force. What is this law all about? When this law of GST was enacted, all the states, including the state where our current Prime Minister was a Chief Minister, Gujarat, also opposed the introduction of GST. The reason was, they, states in India, certain states in India like Gujarat, Tamil Nadu and Maharashtra and these states are all revenue bearing states, meaning they are industrially developed, they contribute high to the revenue of the state. These states opposed the introduction of GST for the reason that post-introduction of GST, revenue to the state would come down because multiple taxes were levied, levied within the state like VAT, there was CST, there was entry tax, there was luxury tax, there was entertainment tax, various tax were collected, octroi, various, all kinds of taxes were levied within the state. All these got subsumed under GST now. So they will lose out revenue on introduction of GST. So on the new government which came into power in 2014, they sat across table and the then finance minister, Mr. Arun Jaitley, after having heard all the problems of every state and as I said, the new federal structure, the GST council, they came with a decision that this can be solved only by compensating the states in addition to the revenue already being given in the form of CGST or SGST or IGST. That was called as compensation to states whereby cess was levied on certain luxury goods on certain supply of goods services like supply of tobacco, supply of cigarettes. So cess varied from 12% to 280%. Whereas GST is only four rates, 6, 12, 18 and 28. Okay. Whereas compensation cess that was that is being collected and which is as I told you there till June 30th, 2022, this varies from 0 to 280%. So on cigarette, so if for example, cigarette of it, the value of the goods is only 10 rupees, after GST and cess that is levied on these, it, is become, it becomes very, very expensive. Even then people don't stop, that's a different matter. But this is the reason Compensation to States Act came into picture, where cess is levied on the supply of certain goods, luxury goods like cars, like tobacco and various other supplies in India on which cess is levied. So this cess is distributed to the states based on the base revenue of every state of the base year. Okay, They have calculated a percentage based on which every year certain percentage of revenue which they feel is uh, being lost by the certain by particular state government is being compensated in this manner. The act itself, when it was enacted in 2017, clearly said this act is going to be for five years and that is coming to an end. And the last chapter, I said GST compensation as the last chapter of the reason being, the these chapters are all technically covered with regard to how GST can be levied how ITC can be claimed, what is the procedural aspect, what is the assessment procedure, all those. The last chapter is an industrial specific chapter where students are going to understand in case of specific industries or sectors, how is the GST coming into force, how can you analyze, what is the revenue loss, what is the impact of GST, all that can be studied under in chapter 11 with regard to the industry and sector specific analysis of certain specific industries like medical, industrial and others. Okay, This is a summary of GST per se. So goods and services tax are summarized in the 10 chapters and the 11th chapter is all about 
the practical implementation of GST on industries. And the 10 marks that you are going to study is also of a vast nature. Even though it is for 10 marks, you have uh, almost 5 chapters to study the customs law of 1962. Customs as itself, uh, the word itself suggests custom. There was a custom in the earlier era of levying tax on in the form of shulka where any other businessman came into the territory of any other territory. From one territory to another territory, if he wants to do business, he has to pay shulka to that kingdom. This formulated over a period of time in the form of customs duty. This law was enacted basically to tax on import or export of goods. However, exports are 100% exempt if they are classified or if the SSE or the supplier follow certain provisions. However, whenever there are imports into India, GST, duty and everything must be covered or is levied and paid. Why imports are taxed? Whenever there is import of goods into India, under the previous regime, we levied certain duties called as the excise duty. As I said, excise duty was levied in case of the taxable event of manufacture. When any goods are imported into India, there are regulations under the WTO to treat every nation as one and equal for the purpose of trade and commerce. They cannot differentiate between goods imported from one country and another country. So based on those principles, customs duty is levied firstly because those goods are coming into India being manufactured in some other country. Okay. Now once it comes into the territory of India, the law levies certain uh, uh, duty called as the basic customs duty in short called as the BCD at the rate specified or the rate that is prevailing. Now after it is brought into India, it has to be treated in par with those goods which are already available or manufactured in India. That is why they levied something called as the countervailing duty. Now excise duty is being subsumed under GST. Now they said instead of CVD, you pay IGST. Because once goods are brought into India, they are considered as deemed manufactured in India and therefore similar taxes that are paid by the local supplier of goods or services or manufacturers must be paid by such importers as well. Therefore, IGST has to be paid not only on the accessible value including basic customs duty. And there is another duty called as the social welfare surcharge which is calculated on the BCD. So, you are going to be uh, studying various aspects with regard to what kind of duties that are going to be levied under the customs law. So, other aspects, most important aspects is valuation principles. Uh, there are rules of valuation for import and export separately. But basically, as I said, almost all exports are exempted except for those notified under the customs uh, law. So, only on such there are export duties, otherwise all, almost 100%, 99.99% of goods that are exported are exempt from tax or from duty. So, valuation principles comes into picture as to how you are going to arrive at the accessible value. Rule 3 and Rule 10 under the customs valuation rules talk about how value of any goods imported into India must be ascertained. Rule 3 talks about the landed value and then rule 10 talks about those values mu which must be added to this to find out the accessible value. Basically, the insurance and the transport which talks about 1.125% of the FOB and then uh, the, the freight or the uh, transportation cost which is calculated at 20% in case of various kinds of freight charges. So, that is going to be discussed detailed uh, in chapter 13 from the point of view of examination under customs law, these two become an essential part of your practical question. How to arrive at the value of supply, value of 
the assessable value of import okay and then what kind of duty should be levied and what is the rate and the calculation of that comes as a practical question for you under this chapter and then post this all of the chapters are basically the procedural aspects under the customs law so for since these are related to import and export the government has to keep a check on every item that comes into india and goes out goes out of india therefore not only if a businessman has to uh, you know keep check of his imports and exports even if a person comes into india then also the customs department keeps a check on the items that he has carried so therefore there are baggage rules defined under the customs so how much can you carry into india baggage rules define you can carry only this amount of any metal or gold or anything that you bring into india electronic component so you can carry it in your baggage but there is a specification you can carry only such number of items such value such weight so those are defined under the baggage rules so that you're going to study under chapter 14 which talks about baggage principles now i have to import or export certain goods i have already paid duty now i find out later that i did not have to pay or those are not dutiable goods can i claim the refund there are certain provisions of refund there are certain provisions of duty drawback drawback under the provisions of customs also so on what duty drawback can be claimed on what refund of duties can be claimed or whether it can be claimed all those can be understood under chapter 14 now chapter 14 also talks about a concept called as warehousing when goods are imported into india it enters the territorial waters it enters or clears the custom station the levy of duty starts that means if you have to clear your goods from the custom station duty must have been paid now the question is can i remove the goods without payment of duty from the custom station there is one concept which is called as warehousing either in a public warehouse or a private warehouse you can remove by filing certain documents with the customs authorities saying that i'm going to remove these goods not into india into the market but for warehousing purpose that can be done in case of two cases where you can delay the payment of duty okay and in second case where there is transshipment of goods that is you have brought into india to be shipped to some other country in such cases also you are exempt from payment of duty or in cases where warehousing is done and then you are going to bring it to the market at the time of removal of goods from the warehouse then you will have to pay the basic customs duty this is going to be discussed under chapter 14 under the customs act as we understood under gst uh what the concepts of advance rulings okay the same concept is also under customs act where advance rulings with regard to any provisions of customs law can be taken by any uh importer exporter and uh, be compliant with the law in case there is any issue under the customs you can approach the settlement commission okay there are appellate tribunals uh, there are procedures laid down as to how you can approach these appellate tribunals if you are uh, if there has been show causes notices or there has been an aggravation of any issue with you with regard to the payment of duty under the customs law uh the offences under customs law falls heavy the penalties are very very heavy in case a person violates the provision there are huge penalties that can be levied for non compliance under the provisions of customs this can be studied in the, in the chapter 15 of the customs uh, under your syllabus in order to ease out the import and export procedure uh the government of india and the legislatures in india have come out with a foreign trade policy this is detailedly discussed under chapter 16 uh so these five chapters talk about how customs law is enacted in india how duty is levied uh, when there are import and exports when igst comes into picture what is the valuation what is the procedural aspects of compliance under gst 
on when can a person uh, be called a importer exporter what is the certificate that need he needs to hold whether he needs to get himself registered all that is covered under the customs uh, this is only for 10 marks so the most important chapters as i told you from theoretical aspect is the pro is the provisions with regard to warehousing with regard to uh, duty drawback and baggage rules and the third aspect is with regard to advance rulings and appellate tribunals and commissions the the practical questions will come under rules of valuation and calculation of duty various kinds of duties are there the only example that they gave you is of basic customs duty there are uh, various other kinds of duties that can be levied uh, uh, in case of imports of goods into india that is discussed as i told you under chapter 13 itself okay this is a summary of customs law uh, and the pro and the chapters that are covered under gst for your syllabus now the question is after studying all this as a professional after you qualify your icsi professional program what is the expectation of the institute and what is the expectation of the market in general basically this subject is a conceptual uh, subject you have to understand the concept as well as the provisions that are laid down each under the laws of gst as well as the customs a conceptual clarity of each of these is required and is expected by the icsi at this level of uh, uh, profession and as i said the market expectations are huge uh, as a professional uh, you are required to advise the company as a compliant officer your advice uh, to the company is most essential in compliance of all these laws that are formulated in india for the betterment of the society and the business community as a whole thank you all the best for your exams